want to welcome all of you here this morning from wherever you may have come from. We're so glad that you took the time to worship with us here at Woodlawn Church. We also have a growing audience of folks that have been watching online. They're live online right now. Could we welcome them in as well? It's good to have all of you from home or traveling or wherever you are. We're so glad to have you. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone that served yesterday, 200 plus people from our church um, out and just did an incredible job. Every job seemed to run so smoothly. Everybody seemed to be full of joy and cooperation and working together. In fact, um, I was actually talking with Brad Morgan uh, in the morning. He was the one leading the food team. They made lunches and delivered lunches out to all the people that were volunteering that day. And I just said, hey, Brad, thank you so much. And he said, you know, he said, I'm just doing my part. And um, this kind of came out of my heart to say, and I think it, it really does have a lot of meaning for all of us. I said, yeah, I said, you're right. I said, when everyone does their part, God does great things. Uh, do y'all believe that? When everybody does their part, God does great things. And uh, God did great things yesterday. The amount of work that got done uh, across 17 different projects in a matter of three or four hours it's staggering to see what can happen, and it uh, just goes to show the power of coming together and, and, and serving God. So we're so, again, just blessed by everybody. I want to say a big thank you to Keith Nutter. Um, Keith Nutter is one of our elders, and uh, Keith is the vice president of Aqua Water in our area here. He's very involved in the community and has a big heart for the community, and he helps with a lot of these outreaches. As a matter of fact, uh, Keith Nutter actually planned and set up all 17 projects. Can we give Keith a big hand? Thank you, Keith. We love you, man. You and Diana. You guys are awesome. And uh, real quick, before I get into the message today, uh, in a couple of weeks, speaking of outdoors and ex enjoying life, we have our next outdoor service on the 13th. If you've never been to an outdoor service, you need to come and be a part of it. They are an awesome experience. Uh, outside, we have like our own built-in amphitheater out there, big stage, LED walls. Um, we have food trucks coming in, all kinds of stuff. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. And we're adding something special for this one we've never done before. We are doing an outdoor water baptism uh, next uh, on that particular week. And if you've never been water baptized, this is your opportunity to be baptized outdoors under the blue sky, in Jesus' name, that we will have that day, right? And uh, we will not be baptizing you out there in the dirty pond like I joked last week. Uh, we actually have our own portable baptismal. And so if you'd like to be baptized, in fact, we had a, a, a young woman sign up and she said, you know, I was, I was baptized as a child and it didn't really have a lot of meaning to me. But since I've become an adult and I'm really serving God with all of my heart, I want to be rebaptized. And we said, absolutely, you go for it. So uh, we have kids being baptized, adults being baptized, seniors being baptized, so if you or any of your loved ones would like to be baptized, you can just click that QR code right there. That QR code is also in your newsletter. You can click that as well and sign up there. You can just go to our website or welcome, welcome desk there, and we'll help get you signed up. But it's a great opportunity to do it in the great outdoors. All right. Well, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word today. And um, if you are new with us today, we're just simply a Bible-believing church. So in our uh, three weekend services, we like to take a moment and just stand up to honor God's word. It's kind of like in our hearts just saying, God, whatever you have to say to me today, my heart is open, speak to my heart. And I hope that is your heart today. We're in a series called Suit Up, which we're looking at a famous portion of scripture in the book of Ephesians talking about the armor of God. And week one, we learned that the battle is real. You know, we live in a physical world, but there's also a spiritual world. And uh, the battles we sometimes face are spiritual, and the Bible teaches us that. So we have to be equipped. Week number two, we talked about this belt of truth. And how many of you know we're in a war for truth in our world today? And um, we need to be able to stand in truth. Uh, and then we have to put this breastplate of righteousness we talked about last week, that Christ is our righteousness. When you come to Christ, God sees us righteous. But then our lives need to continue to become righteous. And today I want to talk about your feet. Yes, we came to talk about feet today. Um, actually, our shoes. That we are to have the shoes of peace on. 
We're living in a very chaotic world where people have a lot of worry and anxiety in their life today. And the one thing that keeps you and I stable in the battles of life is the peace of God. Maybe you came in here today and worry and anxiety has, has racked your life. I got good news for you. God wants you to have peace. We're going to look what the Bible says here, Ephesians 6. Just looking at three verses this morning, back where we were. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. That means we need to understand every piece and how it applies. So that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. We have to stand firm. And then again, he says in verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Father, we pray that you bless this time of sharing in your word today. That Lord, my prayer is that you will impart your peace, Lord, to those that are struggling today. Those that are in the midst of storms and battles and have dealt with worry and fear and anxiety. That God, you would impart your peace that even goes beyond our understanding. In Jesus' name and Amen. And you can be seated this morning. And as you're seated today, I think uh, I I make a a statement that I think we all agree with. How many of you know shoes are a blessing? Shoes are important. How many of you love shoes? How many of you have kids that don't care about shoes? How many of you have kids that shoes are always lost and they can only find one and it's time to go and dad, I can't find a shoe? I'm speaking from my own personal pain uh, in my home. Uh, My kids, they just don't like to wear shoes. Um, As a matter of fact, they run around the church most of the day uh, during the week and the summer as Christy and I are here working all day and they run around with their friends and they have a good time. And when it's time to go to lunch, they're always standing there with their bare feet. I'm like, where are your shoes? I don't know where my shoes are. And as a matter of fact, the other night we were uh, watching TV as a family. We had this little sectional couch and uh, my daughter was kind of sitting on this side of it and her feet were up. And I could not believe how filthy her feet were. I'm like, you go wash those feet before you take all that nastiness into your bed tonight. But uh, they don't care so much about shoes, but we care about shoes, don't we? Because shoes matter. And whatever you're doing, you want the right shoe for the right job, right? So I'm going to put up a couple shoes just for a little uh, audience participation today. If you're wearing this shoe, what are you doing? You're working, right? Yeah, like, uh, like yesterday, some of you had your, your work boots on. Uh, how about this if you have these on? The beach. You're playing, right? Doesn't that just bring peace to your soul looking at that? I just love that. Yeah, typically you're flip-flopping around on the beach or the pool or whatever. Uh, how about this one? Oh, yes. I don't know about you, I am loving this weather God's given us, but winter is coming. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but y'all know, right? It's, it's Ohio. It's coming, so we better get ready to shovel some snow. Uh, here's another one. Um, how about that? What do you think you're doing? Rodeo, maybe you're riding a horse, uh, whatever it is that you do there. Uh, how about these? Crocs. I don't know what you're doing. Um, but here's what I have to say. Crocs rocks? Okay. Well, when I wear Crocs, I absolutely love Crocs. Are there any other Croc lovers? Um, I, when I'm at home, I don't wear slippers, flip-flops. I wear Crocs. I have them on all the time. I have been known to be seen in Drug Mart at 9 o'clock at night with shorts and my skinny legs and my Crocs on. And um, it's just how I roll because they're great. They're, they're like a flip-flop, but they're more comfortable, and you can actually work in them. And I think you pay me to be a commercial for that. Okay, anyways, those have really no exact purpose. Medical field, people would use them. All right, how about this? Um, what y'all doing? Golf outing's coming up here pretty soon. You're, you're playing a little bit of golf. Um, and then uh, how about this one? This one... A little more quiet on that one. Uh, some people say wrestling, close. Uh, this would be uh, the shoe that a boxer would wear. And um, if you, if, it's interesting to know that all of these shoes are made for specific functions and purposes. And when we talk about a boxer, because we're talking about 
um, a, a soldier or a warrior, this armor of God. A boxing shoe is another good example because, um, as you all know, I'm a boxing fan, grew up watching it. And um, what's interesting for those of you that grew up watching, you know, great fighters like maybe Mike Tyson, who is probably the greatest puncher in history, um, you know, it was always amazing to watch him fight guys quite much larger than him and him be able to just kind of take them out. And uh, I, I say that to say that when we look at a boxer, oftentimes you think that maybe Mike Tyson or whoever the great boxers are of our day, that their strength comes maybe from their chest muscles or their arms or their shoulders. But actually, boxing coaches will tell you that a boxer's strength actually comes from his legs. Um, these, uh, the quadriceps and then uh, what's the behind? Hamstring, yeah. So those are the muscles that actually empower a boxer to, to, uh, to punch. In fact, so literally what a, a great boxer will do is they will have their foot. And so these shoes are made, unlike a running shoe where you can kind of run forward just in forward motion, these are made for lateral movements because boxers have to move from side to side, forward and backward. They're slick enough to let them slide, but they're sticky enough for them to be able to plant their foot because a great boxer, when he throws his big punch, he will actually push off the ball of his foot transition through the power of his legs up through his upper body and then he will make contact and that's the secret of a great boxer is it actually starts at their feet and I say all that to say to you and I today as we're looking at this armor of God which um, Paul is looking at you can imagine when Paul was writing Ephesians he actually was in prison and he there was a Roman guard that was stationed by him and uh, he's looking at this Roman guard, and he's looking at all these different pieces of his armor. And he's making an analogy with these pieces of armor how you and I are in a spiritual battle. And uh, we need to be suited up, and we need to have all of these pieces of armor on. Um, as a matter of fact, um, just uh, the other day was my daughter's birthday. And uh, yesterday, we took my daughter Ashlyn out to... Uh, ride her bike. We're teaching her off training wheels to ride a bike. So we had her suited up yesterday. There she was. There's Ashlyn before we went out last night. And I, I, I gladly say we turned those training wheels up and she took off on her first try and she rode. And uh, my legs are sore today because I ran about four miles holding the back of her seat. Um, but she was suited up. And just like she was suited up so she would not get hurt during her bike ride, you and I have to be suited up spiritually. Let me give you a little review. There are six pieces of armor. And out of those six pieces of armor, there are three of them the Bible says you and I are to have on all the time. That's why the Bible says having the belt, having the breastplate, having these shoes or these sandals of peace. These are things as a, as a spiritual warrior we have on all the time. The warrior would wear these all the time. And then you have a shield which you would take up when you need it. You would have a helmet you would put on when needed. You would have a sword you would wield when needed. So the first three you have on all the time. The second three, which we'll get into next week, um, these are things you pick up in time of need. But here's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about these shoes, these shoes of Peace. And so what you need to realize about a Roman soldier, because that's what we're learning from, a Roman soldier's shoes provided them both with stability in the midst of a fight or a battle that they could stand and wield their sword and put their shield up and not give the enemy an inch. They could stand firm. And it also gave them mobility to be able to get where they needed to go quickly. All right. And that's how these uh, these shoes actually worked. Now, you know that uh, every week so far, I've brought you an illustration in this series, so I did not want to disappoint you today. So I brought you, uh, these are actually, check it out, these are bona fide replicas of real Roman soldier sandals. Where do you think I got them from? Amazon Prime, baby. They were on my doorstep in two days. And uh, these are actually real replicas. These are what they looked like. They have these, um, they have these hard soles. Um, in fact, I had one of our staff members come in and model them uh, on Friday. I called this particular staff member into my office, and I asked if they loved God in the church, and they said yes. <laughs> and I said, well, then you got to wear these. And uh, you can guess who that staff member was in a moment. But... Um, 
But if you notice, I put them on the screen because I didn't know if you'd be able to see these real well. But if you notice, um, they're, they're, they're hard on the bottom, and I'll get to why that is in a moment. But then they're vented, so because, you know, obviously being in the Middle East and where they were, it was very hot, so it kept their feet uh, cool. And then they went up around the ankle to support the ankle as well. But what's really interesting about these shoes as well is when you look at the bottom of these shoes, if you want to go to the next slide there, you'll notice that there are like these nail heads on the bottom of these shoes. Now, um, guys that make shoes would call those, a technical term for those are called hobnails. And hobnails are thickly studded headed nails that are real short that they drive into the sole of the shoe. And that actually gives the... Uh, traction to the shoe. So when they were uh, traveling or where if they were standing in, a, in a, a shaky area, sandy area, it would allow them to get traction. So it's pretty neat. So they're hard, um, they're firm, they can handle the tough terrain, they're vented, they support the ankle. These things are awesome. Now, who do you think was wearing those? Zach wore them. Yes, it was Zach wearing them. And uh, so our staff guys, they, they like to joke a lot, all right? So, so he was in his office Friday afternoon bragging to the guys, hey, uh, pastor had me showing off my legs today. And uh, then Andrew knocks on my door, and he's like, what's up? He's like, I've been working out for two years, two years of leg day, and you didn't use my feet? I mean, it was kind of funny to hear these guys talk. But Zach said he wore, won a contest one day. I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. I'm just Let's get spiritual again. Um, but I say all that to say, what did the shoes do? They provided stability and mobility. And it's interesting, the shoes are peace, okay? So the shoes equate to peace. So what I need in my life, what you need in your life, is we need the peace of God in our lives because we cannot survive the, the storms of life, you can't, I can't, without God's peace in our life. You and I will fall every time when we go through the storms of life without God's peace anchoring us. It's God's peace that gives us the grip when all of life is, is swirling around us, when the ground that we're standing on emotionally, spiritually, is, is shaky. When the circumstances are shaky, it is the peace of God that gives us our stability, our footing. It's the peace of God that keeps you and I sane in some of those really intense seasons of life. And so we need the peace of God because the simple truth is, you've heard me say this before, I'm not trying to be a bearer of bad news, but the simple fact of life is the storms are coming, are they not? Um, we live in a fallen world. We have an adversary, the enemy. The Bible tells us clearly about all this. Even Jesus himself said it in John 16, He said, these things I have spoken to you that, notice this, in me, Jesus said. I've, I'm telling you all these things, Jesus said, so that you know that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So the Bible says that you and I in Christ will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation around you. In fact, there's a difference between the world's peace, which is circumstantial, and God's peace, which is internal and everlasting. So we need the peace of God. So if I could give you a definition of what God's peace is, I'll simply say it like this, it is calmness and tranquility of the soul amid difficult circumstances. So that's what peace is. It's this calmness. It's this tranquility of my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. Um, in the midst of difficult seasons of life, when I don't like what's happening, when I'm not sure what the future holds, we all know the opposite of that, right? What is the opposite of that? Worry anxiety, fear. How oftentimes have you found yourself laying awake at one or two or three in the morning, playing out the scenarios in your mind of what might happen at work, to your job, to your industry, to your finances, to the stock market, to your relationships, to your marriage, to your children, to your health? Uh, how oftentimes have we found ourselves obsessing about all of the what-ifs of life and the future? And uh, we, we get caught up in those moments and they can get the best of us. But 
To walk in God's peace means regardless of what's going on around me, just like the shoes for the Roman soldier, it is the peace that anchors me. It is the peace that holds me still in these difficult times that are oftentimes beyond my control. And what's interesting is you can almost see it. There's a story I want to touch on just in the next couple minutes here and there. Uh, It's a story of when Jesus was with his disciples in a boat. And they were going to the other side to minister. And while they're there, the storm kicks up. And while the storm kicks up, um, the disciples, it's a bad storm. And these are seasoned fishermen. And it's real bad. In fact, so bad that these guys are in an all-out panic And while they're panicking, thinking their boat's going to flip over and they are going to die, in the midst of that, Jesus is doing something completely different. Jesus is asleep. Isn't that amazing? So here's this storm. These seasoned fishermen think they're going to die. And yet at the same time, here is Jesus and Jesus is asleep. It shows the, the contrast. And I believe that, and, I, and I can't say that I've always been good at living this out. Um, I used to always joke and say I think I was born a natural-born warrior. I don't know if anybody like me. I've come a long way. Um, but I believe that peace should be the natural default of the believer. Like instead of immediately your mind and your heart going to worry, going to playing out all the negative scenarios, that your mind and your heart goes to peace. It goes to trust in God. I, I truly believe that's God's heart for us. So in the next 12 minutes or less, I'm going to give you three things about peace that you and I need to grasp. And here is number one. And that is that peace is what I have because Jesus lives in me. Don't miss that. Peace is what you and I have because Jesus lives in us. Just a couple chapters earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said it like this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were a afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So the Bible teaches you and me that that Jesus himself actually is our peace. He is the source of our peace. In fact, he said it like this in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Wow, that's a rich little scripture there. So Jesus' gift to you and I is peace, and it's his peace. His peace is different than the world's peace. Somebody wisely said the world's peace is hard to get and it's easy to lose. It's hard to get, it's easy to lose. Why? Because the world's peace is if everything's going okay on the job, with my business, in my marriage, in my family, with my health, then I have peace. But the moment that is upset, I do not have peace any longer. And you all know that 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 can change in a heartbeat. You can wake up and be at peace. You can go open your email at work and your whole world can fall apart just like that. And so we realize that that's not the peace we're looking for, but Jesus gives us a peace not as the world gives. Jesus gives me peace in the midst of the storm. He gives me peace when everything around my my life and in my world is absolutely spinning and is out of control. In fact, let me say it like this. Peace is internal, it's not external. Remember last week I gave you those sketches of us being a three-part being? We are a body. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then we have our spirit, When you and I are born again, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are made new. We are born of the Spirit. God comes and lives in our hearts via the Holy Spirit. So there we are made righteous. There we are made perfect. There the presence of God is with us all the time. And from there we are to live our lives from the inside out. Then that peace and that joy needs to get from here into my soul, my mind, my will, and emotions, and my body needs to follow suit with what God wants for me. And so what has to happen is we realize that the peace of God has nothing to do with what's happening to me. The Bible even calls it, in the book of Galatians, it's a fruit of the Spirit. 
So it's a fruit of the work of God from deep down in your spirit, and it in, begins to permeate the rest of who you are. It's a fruit of the spirit. So let me just say it like this. Uh, how many of you know this to be true? Our environment always reveals our inner nature, right? Our environment always reveals the inner nature. So whatever is happening to you and me, it has a way of revealing what's going on inside of us. For example, uh, if you were to take a sponge and squeeze it, whatever, is in, whatever liquid is in that sponge is coming out once it's squeezed. Jesus said it like this, John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. In the original Greek language, that means crushing, squashing, or squeezing. So life's going to squeeze us, and what's going on on the inside is going to come out. Have you ever been squeezed and you didn't like what came out of you? Anger came out of you. Words that you wish you could take back came out of you. Frustration came out of you. Faithless words came out of you. Whatever it is, whatever's going on on the inside, when life squeezes us, it comes out. Kind of back to our Jesus in the boat storm. There's a storm going on. Jesus is asleep, so the storm's raging. His inner nature is peace, and the disciples are freaking out, so they wake him up, and they're like, Jesus, and here's what they said. Don't you care that we're about to die? Can you imagine accusing God Almighty? Have we ever done that before, though? Can we all be real today? God, where are you? Why are you letting this happen to me? What is going on? Don't, I thought you, I thought the Bible tells me you love me. This does not look like love. Have you ever been there before? And they're freaking out. They're accusing God. And I love what Jesus does. He just gets up, walks out there, looks at the winds and the waves and says, be still. And immediately everything goes still. You know, God has the power to still the storms in your life like that. There used to be an old Christian song. Go back with me, folks. Sometimes God calms the storm and sometimes he calms his child. Sometimes the greatest glory that God gets is when he calms us in the midst of the storm. And then the storm gets calm eventually. But the idea is, is that what you and I go through oftentimes reveals. So the Bible says in Colossians, and there's, I wish I had more time this morning, but there's so much we could go into. But Colossians 3.15 says it like this. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called to be holy, or to called to be one body and to be thankful. So the Bible says we're to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. You know, every Christmas we celebrate the fact that um, Jesus is the prince of what? He's the prince of peace, right? So he reigns in my heart as the prince of peace. He reigns as king over my heart, and peace is like the governor. So in essence, you and I can know oftentimes what God's will is by the peace we have or we don't have. God oftentimes will lead us by peace. If you're getting ready to make a major decision in your life and you've been praying about it and you can't get peace, that's usually an indication that God is trying to hold you back from that. He doesn't want, there's something there that you don't realize. Um, if you're getting, you just don't feel a peace about your kids going to a certain school or, or being in partnership with that person or whatever it is, if you don't feel a peace, you need to be careful that you listen to that peace. We're going to do a series coming up down the road here called Doors, how God opens and closes doors in our life. And peace is oftentimes, or the lack of, is how God oftentimes leads you and I in life. But here's point number two this morning, and that is this, that peace is released into our soul through spiritual discipline, all right? I love the scripture that Paul gives us in Philippians. He says, be anxious for what? Everything? Everything? No, it says nothing, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, I want you to just take a moment. If you're sitting next to someone you know, if you don't know them, it'd be a little creepy, so don't do this. <laughs> but if you know them, just look at them and smile. Tell them they look fantastic today. Now, if you're at home, do the same. 
Okay, this is what I want you to say to that person. This is a great, great encouragement today. Tell them this. Be anxious for nothing. Let me ask you, are you anxious today? Did you come in here anxious about something in your life? Have you been robbed of your peace? Are you struggling in an area of your life with worry and anxiety and fear? God wants you to... Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Then check this out, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's the promise. If I feel anxious, I should do something. And if I do this, the Bible says that I will have a peace that will even go beyond my understanding. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you were facing a crisis and you, for some reason, you just had peace that you couldn't describe? You got a bad doctor's report and I don't know why, but I just feel like God's got this and there's peace. Your industry's upside down that you work in and for some reason you just have this peace in your heart? That's God's peace. That's that inward peace that's trans-circumstantial. It goes beyond our circumstances and it helps us to understand the situation that we live in with our minds and not just our emotion. So you look at that and you, you can see that in, in our lives. And so as we do that, there's a couple things we need to do. Number one is to pray. Discipline says, instead of worry, I'm going to pray. Here's what the Bible actually teaches us in Colossians. It says, casting, I love how the Amplified Bible says, casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. So the Bible says my job is to cast that that burden that I have. I, I throw it on to God. I give it to him. Because he cares for me. With deepest affection, he watches over us. Think about that for a moment. God cares about you and loves you just like a father. You know, mom and dad, how often have we worried about our kids? How often have we worried about the welfare of our kids? The Bible says you and I have a heavenly father. If you are walking with God that is watching over you, And he watches over you carefully. I'm a firm believer what Jimmy Evans said years ago. I agree with what he said. That people that have excessive amounts of anxiety and worry in their life, it really stems from having an orphan spirit. It's not understanding the love of your heavenly father. Like an orphan that doesn't have parents there to care for them. There's fear in their life. But for you and I that truly understand the love and the care of God, We don't have to have anxiety. Jimmy Evans, who did a lot with families, went on to say that he said that well-parented, that's why well-parented children are typically fearless when they face life because they've been parented well. They don't have a lot of fears that other kids that weren't parented well. Well, you and I have a heavenly father that cares about everything in your life and mine. He's already been to your future and God calls us to trust him. So we pray. And then here's the other thing is we're thankful We are thankful people. The Bible says to make my request with thanksgiving. Why in the world would God ask me to do that? Because thankfulness fuels your faith. I'm going to give you some homework this week. Here's your homework. Don't worry. We're not grading it. But this is your homework. This week, every time you feel, feel ready to worry, pray about it. And every day when you're on your way to work or whatever you start your day, find three things that you can be thankful to God for in your life. You want to know why? Because when you and I express thankfulness, it stirs our faith. God, thank you that you came through for me in the past. Thank you that you provided me this house, this job, this family. Thank you that you were there last time. And Lord, I'm believing you're going to be there again. Because what thankfulness does is it reminds us of just how great this God is. Think about that for a moment. We sang about how great our God was this morning, how mighty he was. I loved the imagery that was on the screens as we worshiped. 
like the Grand Canyon and all that stuff. Like, do you realize God created that? He created that. And the Bible said he watches over you carefully as your heavenly Father. And what God wants for you and I in the storms of life is to be rooted and grounded and stable in his love and in his peace, regardless of what the doctor says, regardless of what the bank account says, regardless of what somebody says to you. If I had more time, I'd go, I'd go into number three, but I'll just, I'll just throw it out there for you today. And that is that peace is what I make because Jesus works through us. It's what we make. Some of you might remember a few years ago when we did 27 weeks in the book of Matthew on the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Part of your job and mine is not only to be people of peace, but remember the shoes. They brought mobility. So not only do we have the peace of God and we're stable in the storms of life, but you and I take the peace of God into our situations. When you walk into chaos at work, you should be a person that brings peace. When there's struggles in your family, you walk in there and you bring peace. Situations, places, relationships, atmospheres should be different because we as believers are peacemakers. We also, the greatest thing we do is bring the gospel of peace to people, that they might be at peace with God. But you and I should be people of peace. Heard a gentleman years ago that said, peacemaking is really the DNA of a true believer. That's why we're called children of God when we're peacemakers. One guy by the name of Kent Hughes basically said, he said, he said, if you're not a peacemaker and a troublemaker, you may not be a believer at all. Because things are better when we're there. And so, because peace lives within me, I can establish peace around me. And I think that's important for us to understand. Because peace, Jesus Christ, my peace lives within me. I can have it in my heart and I can establish it in my life and my relationships. Because that should be the natural default of the believer, peace. So let me ask you a question today. Is your boat rocking? Are you in a season of life where things feel a little out of control? Have you found yourself worrying about tomorrow or about your kids or about your relationships or about your future? Have you been robbed of that soul, deep-seated peace beyond understanding? What I want to do that something is a little different this morning I'm going to ask you as we close our message today for everybody to stand up. And if you feel comfortable, we're going to ask you to worship with us for a, just a moment or two this morning before we wrap up our service. And here's what I believe in the next few moments. Some of you have been dealing with anxiety and fear, and it is ruining your life. And I believe in this moment, you and I can connect with God. We're going to sing about how great He is, how mighty He is. He created those mountains. He made those mountains. What's a little mountain that you and I have in our life? Could we take just a moment and get our eyes off our circumstances, get our eyes off our debt, get our eyes off our concerns, and just take a moment and get our eyes on Jesus this morning for a moment? Would you worship with me for just a moment? Let God bring peace into your life today. Come on, let's lift up this praise. Sing in glory, sing. And glory, glory in a thousand hallelujahs. Oh, Lord, my God, how great you are.
magnify you today. We praise you today. We thank you that you love us and care for us. And you are the mountain moving God. We thank you for your peace today. In Jesus' name. You know, oftentimes in the Psalms, David would say, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. When you magnify something, you make it bigger. And I really believe thanksgiving and worship, you know what that does? It magnifies how big God is. It stirs your faith. Do you know what worry does? Worry and anxiety magnifies the problem. It makes it daunting. It makes it larger than life. It squelches your faith. So that's why God has called us to be people that magnify Him. And when we do that, peace comes because He's the mountain mover. Amen. Father, I just pray you give peace to your people today. Those that are watching online as well. God, let the peace of God. Lord, I just got this sense in my, my spirit that there are people that have been tormented, to literally tormented by worry and anxiety. And I just pray that in this moment that they would receive a miracle from, from you today. That they would just receive the miracle of your peace. That there would be peace that goes beyond understanding. That they would experience it in their hearts and their lives today. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, with your eyes closed, heads bowed before Pastor Dan wraps up. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And I wanna invite you to pray along with me this morning um, if you need this especially. Um, but we just ask everybody to pray it just so we don't embarrass anybody. But if you need Christ, if you would pray along with us, could we just say this? Could we say, Jesus, I thank you that you are my peace. I put my faith in you today as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to walk with you in Jesus' name. And amen. God bless y'all.